Hello and welcome to Funerals in the Rain. If you enjoy these videos, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. Hello and welcome to Funerals in the Rain Ghost Stories for the Christmas season. And my first story will be Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Stave one. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail of mine. I don't mean to say that I know of mine own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail i might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of iron mongery in the trade but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile and my unhallowed hand still shall not disturb it or the country's done for you will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that marley was as dead as a doornail scrooge knew he was dead of course he did how could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he was he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary leg legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral. And solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. If we were not particular, perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts. Then there would be in, a, in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say St. Paul's churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterward, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley, the firm was known as Scrooge and Marley sometimes. People knew to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as a flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it out one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. The offing came down handsomely and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gl gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what 
what it was o'clock no man or woman ever in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of scrooge even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him and when they saw him coming on would tug their owners in doorways and up courts and then would wag their tails as though they said no eye at all is better than an evil eye dark master but what did scrooge care it was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life Wanting all human sympathy to keep distance was what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy, whittle, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing and up, up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts, and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm, warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices, like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came peer, pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms to see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything. One might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing up a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal, dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it. Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with a shovel, and the master predicted that it would not be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candles, in which effort, not being... A man of strong imagination, he failed. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below. And stay tuned for part two of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. A month long of Christmas ghost stories from Funerals in the Rain.